But let us return to Western Europe. The period from the 5th to the 10th through 11th centuries is the period of the birth of European civilization as we know it today. A huge calderon in which a soup of new states, nations, identity was brewed on the coals of the great Roman Empire, the great migration of nations. It is this time that should be considered the Dark Ages. A place is not empty, and as soon as the iron hand of the Romans weakened, numerous tribes living both in Eastern Europe and in Asia in the fourth century suddenly arose from their habitual places and headed westward to the borders of the Roman Empire. Scholars offered various explanations for this phenomenon. The climate changed. There were fewer habitable areas. The number of tribal wars increased. An important role in the great migration of peoples was played by a militant tribe of nomadic Huns who lived in the Asian steeps and moved westward to find new pastures for their livestock, driving other tribes from their places of residence. The territory of the Roman Empire attracted its neighbors with its wealth and highly developed culture. The Romans called the tribes living outside the borders of their empire barbarians. The barbarians who settled on Roman territory became actively involved in political and cultural life. The barbarians began to feel like full-fledged citizens of the empire. Throughout the fifth century, Germanic tribes settled throughout the Western Roman Empire. In the territories they occupied, the Germans founded their own states. In North Africa, a state of the Vandals. In Southern Gaul, a state of the Visigoths. In Northern Gaul, a state of the Franks. In Italy, a state of the Ostgoths. In Britain, a state of the Angles and Saxons. There were other, smaller barbarian states as well. Barbary states are commonly called kingdoms because the role of the ruler, the king, was very important for the organization of such a state. Barbarian kings fought a lot, so their power largely depended on personal talents, intelligence, courage, strength, and the ability to form alliances with other kings. Thus, the Scandinavian world came into close contact with the rest of Europe. By sailing the rivers, the Danish Vikings found themselves deep inside many lands. In the first half of the 9th century, there were found in present-day Germany, France, and the Netherlands. The Nordic men fortified themselves there and made their raids on other countries from there. In the early 10th century, the Normans created the Duchy of Normandy in northern France. In turn, the Norse Vikings conquered and established colonies on islands near and far. The Orkney Islands, the Faroe Islands, Ireland, and Iceland. They discovered Greenland and came to the east coast of North America around the year 1000. The Swedish Vikings ruled mainly in the Baltic Sea and sailed as far as Constantinople along the great Russian rivers. The Metropolitan Collection boasts several interesting pieces and helps us to introduce the cultures of a legendary people. Historically, Scandinavia gave us another tribe that would become the basis of the new European civilization. The Visigothic Kingdom arose in southern Gaul with its capital at Toulouse in 418. The homeland of Germanic tribes, known under the collective name of the Goths, is southern Scandinavia. From there, they moved into what is now Poland, and then through Belarus. And the Ukraine came into the northern Black Sea and the lower Danube. In the course of their migration, the Goths had two tribal formations, the Oskos and the Visigoths. In the middle of fourth century, came upon them Huns from the depths of Asia, who defeated the Oskos and drew them into the orbit of their movement. The Visigoths, fleeing from the Hunnish threat, migrated beyond the Danube 
in the territory of the Roman Empire. Faced with the oppression of the local authorities there, the Visigoths moved to the eastern capital of the empire, Constantinople. In 378, they defeated the Romans in Adrianople, then ruined the Peloponnese. In 410 year, they captured and sacked Rome, marched through the southern Italy, and finally, in 418 year, were in the southern Gaul. The Visigoth kingdom, at the time of its demise, had a history of nearly 300 years, the longest of the continental Germanic kingdoms except the Frankish. From the beginning of the 6th century, after the conquest by the Franks of most of the Visigoth possessions in Gaul, the Visigoths migrated in great numbers to Spain. This country henceforth became their new homeland and the remnants of their possessions in southern Gaul lost their former importance. Since the middle of the 6th century, the capital of the kingdom had been Toledo, a geographically advantageous location, perfectly fortified by nature. The Franks fought back against the Arab conquest, and in 751, Pepin the Short, with the support of Pope Zacharias, proclaimed himself king of the Frankish state and founded a new dynasty, the Carolingian. In addition, Charles was famous as a great reformer. He undertook enormous ecclesiastical reforms connected with the educational system, with the unification of church worship and monastic communion, with the correction of religious texts, and so on. He gathered to the court the best European scholars. For nearly 200 years, starting in the 9th century, Carolingian minuscule was, one might say, almost the only type of writing in Western Europe. Then, the Carolingian minuscule was superseded by the Gothic script. The Carolingian Renaissance is one of the most important results of Charles as a sovereign, politician, Christian, and human being. It left us a tremendous cultural legacy. It is not just the works of Carolingian writers themselves. Hey, geographies, poems, deeds, biographies, histories, letters, scientific and religious treatises. In the collection of the museum, there is a large collection of women's jewelry. Let's get acquainted. Initially, these are pieces with a pronounced affiliation to the barbaric animal style. Brooch in the form of a bird, 500 to 600 Y.O. Frankish. The dress of Frankish women usually consisted of a tunic tied with a belt from which many pendants dangled. A cloak or cape was worn over the tunic. Shoes and stockings, fastened with buckles, covered the legs. In jewelry from the ancient world to the Middle Ages, we find the hemispherical cabochon stone. The most usual type of stone cut is of the oval or round shape, one with side flat. The cabochon is more of a polished stone than a cut. This cut is suitable for almost all jewelry stones, especially for those with optical effects such as asterism or cat's eye. Asterism is the ability of a stone to refract light in the form of a star with many beams. Rubies, sapphires, beryls, and spinels are the minerals that may have such ability. And if they are cut as cabochons, they will become truly unique, as unique as the jewelry in the museum's collection. The church taught that if sin entered the world through the first woman, Eve, then salvation from sin also entered through Our Lady Mary, for the atoning death of Jesus Christ was only possible after his earthly birth by Mary. In the East, for the first time, her name was given to temples, fourth century. Her images were painted, and church festivals were introduced in her honor, 5th century. The Council of Ephesus in the East, in 431, deemed it possible to call the Virgin Mary Mother of God. Thus, the cult of the Virgin Mary merged with the basic tenets of early Christianity and took a prominent place in this new religion. The first known sculptural image of Our Lady, the so-called Golden Virgin of Eason, was commissioned by the granddaughter of Otto II, Abbess Matilda, 
presumably around 980. This is how the sculpture returned to art. We already know that antiquity gave us architectural orders. The Middle Ages changes the currency and leaves of the column capitals to amazing stonework. In many monasteries in Europe, many scenes from the Bible, hagiographies of saints, allegorical images as a confrontation of vices and virtues, as well as imitating figures of demons and various monsters, beasts and men woven together were carved on the capitals of columns on which galleries were leaned. The museum collection has interesting versions of such capitals. A reliquary is the repository of a relic, that is, a shrine. It may be relics of a saint or a part of them, a piece of the Holy Cross or other objects connected with the earthly life of the Savior and his saints, or with the posthumous veneration of the saints. As a rule, reliquaries are richly and solemnly decorated, thus expressing veneration for the sacred things they contain. It is the custom of churches to build temples on the relics of saints. The rule that no church can be built unless it possesses holy relics was adopted by the Fifth Council of Carthage. Rule 10. In the 6th and 8th centuries, however, there were still isolated deviations from this rule. It was forbidden by the Seventh Ecumenical Council to build churches without relics. The Bible for the poor, or the visual depiction of scenes of biblical subjects, could not exist without the option of reflecting emotion. And so, for all the lethargy in plastic and pictorial art, we should note the Middle Ages gave us emotions. We did not see them in Egypt, Greece, Rome. So, in medieval Europe, there were two main customers of decorative art, the church and the feudal nobility. And if the church had all forms personifying art, the nobility and later and just wealthy citizens also considered it necessary to be the owners of such attributes. So, in the art enters small plastics, small sculptures on religious themes. Numerous Madonnas, other saints, scenes of the birth, passion and removal of Jesus from the cross, as well as numerous crucifixes. The technique of making statues and figurines is very different. Casting, molding, embossing, forging, carving. Also, the materials used for production are different. Plaster, ceramic, stone, and wooden statues are popular with owners of castles and private homes. Fine statuettes carved from precious stones, gold, silver, and ivory fill interiors. We end our look at medieval art in the halls of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Next time, we encounter it within the walls of a medieval monastery, the Cloisters Museum.